Well, hello again, everyone. This is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am so excited that you're here with me today for episode 194, where we look at amiodarone, a very common drug that you will see in the clinical setting. Before we do that, let's take a quick minute for a San Fam shout out, and that goes to Brandy. Brandy, I love what you had to say about boot camp, so here it is. Boot camp prepared me for my first semester of nursing school. I am entering semester three, and I continue to utilize straight-A nursing with the Beyond Boot Camp material. Thank you for providing a great resource for us nursing students. Brandy, I'm so glad that Crucial Concept Boot Camp and Beyond Boot Camp are helping you be successful in nursing school. So what Brandy is talking about is my nursing school prep course, Crucial Concepts Boot Camp, which is on sale for a few more days if you want to get into that for 20% off. I'll put the link in the episode notes. And then she also added on Beyond Boot Camp, which dives into med surge topics to help her continue that success. So thank you again, Brandy, for sharing. I hope that you continue to do well. Send me an email when you get your NCLEX so I can personally congratulate you for succeeding on this incredible journey. So today we're diving into pharmacology, looking at amiodarone. Again, it's a very common medication that you will see used both for acute conditions in the clinical setting and patients will take it chronically as outpatients to manage heart issues as well. We'll go through amiodarone using the Straight A Nursing Drugs Framework, D-R-R-U-G-S. So D stands for drug class. When you know the medication's drug class, you kind of already know a ton of things about the medication, and you have to memorize a lot less. So amiodarone is in the therapeutic class of antiarrhythmics. Specifically, it's a class 3 antiarrhythmic, which is further classified as potassium channel blocker. These medications work by altering membrane ion conduction, which then alters cardiac action potentials. Now recall that the potassium channels play a key role in repolarization. And when we block these channels, we delay repolarization and increase the effective refractory period. The result is that we suppress what's called re-entry tachycardias. Note that this will also prolong the QT interval, and if you want to learn more about the QT interval and why we care so much about it, but hardly anyone measures it, then I want you to take a quick detour and listen to that episode. I'm going to link to that in the episode notes. Okay, so that's the drug class for amiodarone, antiarrhythmic class Three, which is a potassium channel blocker. The first R in drugs is for the route. A lot of medications can be given via multiple routes, so it's important to know. Amiodarone can be given via an IV infusion or PO as a tablet. How we typically utilize amiodarone in the clinical setting is that, let's say a patient needs, they're not already taking amiodarone, right? They're in the hospital and they go into some kind of heart rhythm that requires amiodarone. So what we do is we start an IV infusion of the amiodarone, and then if they're going to continue to need it, transition them to the PO form with the tablets if they're going to be taking it long term. Now, the second R in the drugs framework is for the regular dose range. Now, the dose of amiodarone is going to depend on whether it's IV or tablet and what it's being used for. So for ventricular arrhythmias, we can give amiodarone either PO or IV. Now, the dose for PO amiodarone is going to start high and then taper down to a maintenance dose. 
That starting dose is going to be between 800 to 1600 milligrams per day, and that could be in one dose or two divided doses. And the patient takes that for a period of typically one to three weeks. Then the amiodarone is decreased further to about 600 to 800. And again, that's in one or two divided doses for about a month. And then it's further decreased to a maintenance dose of 400 milligrams a day. Most of the time, what you're going to be seeing is patients on their maintenance dose. Now, the IV form of amiodarone for ventricular arrhythmias is first given as a bolus of 150 milligrams over 10 minutes. We then follow this with 360 milligrams given over the next six hours. So for six hours, it's going to go at one milligram per minute. And then the patient will get 540 milligrams for the next 18 hours. So for that 18 hours, they're getting 0.5 milligrams per minute. Now, some patients will stay on this 0.5 milligrams per minute until they are fully transitioned to oral therapy, if they are indeed transitioning to oral therapy. Now, amiodarone is also sometimes used in ACLS for pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. The dose for this is 300 milligrams IV push, and you can follow that with a 150 milligram dose after three to five minutes. There's a max dose of amiodarone of 2.2 grams in 24 hours. So if you have a patient who's coding multiple times, you might want to keep track of how much amiodarone they have received. Now for supraventricular tachycardias, patients are usually given PO amiodarone. And again, we start at a higher dose and taper down to a maintenance dose. And the starting dose is six to 800 milligrams per day, and that's for about a week. And then we have the desired response. We'll taper down to 400 milligrams a day for about three weeks. And then maintenance dose is typically two to 400 milligrams per day. Again, when you see patients that come in who are taking amiodarone long-term, most of the time they're going to be on their maintenance dose between two to 400 milligrams per day. If the dose is higher than that, chances are they very recently started their amiodarone therapy. So U stands for uses. What is amiodarone used for? It's always really important to know why your patient is getting any particular medication. A lot of times medications are used for multiple purpose, and sometimes they're used off-label. So always, always know. Amiodarone is used to treat ventricular tachycardia with or without a pulse, ventricular fibrillation, and supraventricular tachyarrhythmias, namely atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. All right, let's move on to the G, and this is the one with a lot of information. G stands for the guidelines, the guidelines around administering amiodarone. And the reason there's a lot of guidelines is because amiodarone is very potent medication, and it comes with a lot of monitoring and safety factors. So first of all, amiodarone is a Beers drug, and if you're not sure what I mean, then you need to go listen to the episode on the Beers list and what that means. I will link to that in the episode notes. Next, because this medication affects cardiac conduction, it's going to be avoided in patients with conduction deficits, namely second and third degree AV blocks. It is also avoided in patients with bradycardia who do not have a pacemaker. Amiodarone also has a lot of drug-to-drug interactions. The key ones to know are that it will cause increased levels of digoxin and class 1 antiarrhythmics such as lidocaine. It will also increase theophylline levels as well as phenytoin levels, cyclosporine levels, and 
carvedilol. So if your patient's taking any of those, you want to make sure that they are not having drug toxicity or overdose from those. Another key drug interaction is warfarin. Amiodarone will increase the activity of warfarin, so the patient will likely need dose adjustments to decrease their bleeding risk and just make sure that they're getting the right effect from their warfarin while they're taking the amiodarone. Now, patients who are taking amiodarone should not drink grapefruit juice because grapefruit juice inhibits enzymes in the GI tract that metabolize this medication. And drinking grapefruit juice would lead to increased levels and risk for toxicity. You will want to monitor the EKG continuously during IV amiodarone infusion and initiation of PO therapy. Amiodarone can cause some pretty significant respiratory complications, including pulmonary toxicity and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So monitor your patient's respiratory status carefully. Patients who take amiodarone long-term should probably be getting regular chest x-rays and pulmonary function tests. Now, due to its high iodine content of about 37%, amiodarone can cause thyroid dysfunction. So you want to monitor your patient for signs of hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. You'll also be monitoring some labs for this patient. Anyone taking amiodarone is going to get liver function tests, AST, ALT, and alkaline phosphatase done. You'll also monitor their calcium, magnesium, and potassium levels because if the patient has deficiencies in those, it can decrease effectiveness of the amiodarone. One thing to know about IV amiodarone is that it must be administered through an inline filter. And that filter will either come with the medication from the pharmacy. If your pharmacy is super organized, the amiodarone will come with a little filter like taped to the outside of the bag. A lot of times it's not. You just have to know to grab that filter It should be in the medication administration record, but if you're not reading every little detail carefully, that is something that could be missed, so make sure that you know that. Key teachings for your patient are to monitor their pulse daily, avoid that grapefruit juice, and the patient should understand that side effects can appear up to a year after therapy is started. And then you want to teach your patient that the effects of the amiodarone can persist for months after discontinuation due to the drug's long half-life of up to 100 days. So it has a very long half-life. So there's a lot of guidelines around giving amiodarone. There's definitely more. These are the key ones. And then the S in the drugs framework refers to side effects. Amiodarone has a pretty significant side effect profile, and it can affect many organ systems. This includes the eyes, the endocrine system, the GI tract, the cardiovascular system, and the neurological system. So some common side effects include corneal microdeposits, nausea and vomiting, constipation, and anorexia, kind of the GI tract symptoms right there, nausea and vomiting, constipation, and anorexia. And then neurologically, ataxia, involuntary movements, peripheral neuropathy, dizziness, and fatigue. Those are common neurological side effects. Cardiovascularly, you could have hypotension, bradycardias. Photosensitivity can occur, and that can even be present through glass. So just being next to a window with sunlight coming through, thin clothing, and even with sunscreen. So patients need to be very careful. And then endocrine-wise, that hypothyroidism, 
that we talked about earlier. Hyperthyroidism can also occur, but it's more likely to be hypo when the thyroid is affected. Now, the most serious side effects are cardiac, pulmonary, and dermatologic in nature. So pulmonary ones, pulmonary fibrosis, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, and pulmonary toxicity, all very serious life-threatening. Cardiac-wise, for the really serious side effects, we have prolonged QT intervals, which can lead to ventricular fibrillation or torsades de pointe, both of which are lethal ventricular rhythms, and you can have worsening of arrhythmias and even heart failure. A dermatologic condition that is very serious is called toxic epidermal necrolysis. Though it is rare, it is life-threatening. And then one that's not very common, but it seems like the sort of thing that would show up on a nursing school exam is that the patient can have a bluish discoloration to the skin of the arms, face, and neck after prolonged use. And this is temporary. It will go away once the medication is stopped. Again, that medication has a long half-life, so it may take a long time, but that bluish discoloration should not be permanent. So there you have it, your quick introduction to amiodarone. And let's just do a quick, brief, brief overview of the very key, most important things to know. Okay, are you ready? Amiodarone is a treatment for supraventricular and ventricular tachyarrhythmias. It comes in PO and IV form. If you give it IV, use an inline filter. There are many drug-to-drug interactions, and patients should avoid grapefruit juice. Side effects can be significant and involve multiple organs, and patients should be on continuous EKG monitoring during IV infusions and initiation of oral therapy. So let's do a little bit of a pod quiz with this one to help you really solidify your understanding of amiodarone. So if you're new to pod quizzes, I'm going to ask you a question, pause a moment, give you time to think of the answer, and go ahead, say it out loud. Nobody's watching. And then I'll tell you the answer. And if you like this style of quizzing, then you want to check out Study Sesh in the episode notes. It's my podcast dedicated to pod quizzes and a few other types of auditory learning modalities. Okay, so what drug class is amiodarone? Tell me the basic therapeutic class first. Antiarrhythmics, and then more specifically, what class of antiarrhythmic? Class three, and then what is that? What is a class three antiarrhythmic? What is it blocking? That was a hint. It's a potassium channel blocker. Very, very good. So when we have that potassium channel blocking, what is that going to do to repolarization? It's going to delay repolarization. And what does this do in turn to the QT interval? It can prolong that QT interval. And why do we care? What lethal rhythms can occur with a prolonged QT interval? One was ventricular fibrillation, and the other is torsades de pointe. Very good. What are the two routes that you can give amiodarone? You can give it IV or PO in a tablet form. Okay, when we are looking at amiodarone, what is the general maintenance dose range going to be. Regardless of why it's used, I told you a general maintenance dose range that you're likely to see amiodarone. Generally 200 to 400 milligrams per day. Now remember, therapy will start with a higher dose and then taper down in most cases. So if you see higher than that, 
chances are the patient is still in that tapering down phase. Okay, let's look at the guidelines for giving amiodarone. You are going to avoid giving amiodarone to a patient with a heart rate of 55 who does not have this other item in place. What is that other item? A pacemaker. Very good. Amiodarone should be avoided in patients who have a bradycardia without a pacemaker present. Amiodarone has a lot of drug-to-drug interactions. What is it going to do to the digoxin level? It's going to increase levels of digoxin as well as theophylline, phenytoin, cyclosporine, and carvedilol, as well as others. I just picked some of the most common ones. What will amiodarone do to warfarin? Amiodarone is going to increase the activity of warfarin. And what does that do to the patient's bleeding risk? That will increase their bleeding risk. Very good. What beverage does your patient need to avoid if they're taking amiodarone? Grapefruit juice. And is that because grapefruit juice is going to cause decreased levels of the drug or increased levels of the drug? Increased levels. Very good. What do you want to monitor while your patient's getting IV amiodarone? The EKG, you will have continuous monitoring. What element in the amiodarone puts the patient at risk for thyroid dysfunction? Iodine. About 37%. That seems like a lot of iodine. When you are giving IV amiodarone, what other little device are you going to use for safety? An inline filter. And then when we're looking at the side effects of amiodarone, the common side effects, tell me about the common side effect regarding the eyes. What was it called? Corneal microdeposits. And then what would be the common GI side effects? Nausea and vomiting, constipation, anorexia. And then name a few, because there were several, name one or two of the common neurological side effects of amiodarone. So we have ataxia, involuntary movements, peripheral neuropathy, dizziness, and fatigue. So you get a gold star if you got any one of those. What about common cardiovascular side effects? We'll talk about the significant life-threatening ones in a moment, but what about common ones? Hypotension and bradycardia. What about common dermatologic side effect? That is photosensitivity, even through glass, thin clothing, and with wearing sunscreen. And then what about endocrine? What common side effect can occur to the endocrine system? Hypothyroidism. Hyper can happen as well, but again, hypothyroid is more common than hyperthyroidism with amiodarone. Now we're looking at the very, very serious life-threatening side effects. There's cardiac, pulmonary, and dermatologic ones. 
So looking at the cardiac serious life-threatening side effects, do you remember what any of those were? If you get one, you get a gold star. So we have prolongation of the QT interval. We have worsening of arrhythmias and heart failure. What about the pulmonary life-threatening complications? Name one or two of those if you can. So pulmonary fibrosis, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, and pulmonary toxicity. And then what is the life-threatening dermatologic side effect called? Toxic epidermal necrolysis. Very, very good. And then what color could the arms, face, and neck turn after prolonged use? Bluish color. Not life-threatening, but just really interesting. Okay, you guys, you did fantastic. If you liked reviewing in that pod quiz format, again, check out study sesh. You will absolutely love it. It's a fantastic way to just free yourself from your desk, feeling like you're always having to sit and look at a screen or sit and look at a book or your notes. You can study, review, recall information while you're up and moving around. It is life changing. Okay, next week, we're going to be talking about a common pediatric disorder called RSV. See you then. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.